I'll be reading chapter 26 of Restart, and this chapter is called Joel Weber. My black eye doesn't hurt anymore, although I look like I lost a game of chicken with an Amtrak train. Appearance-wise, the healing process might be worse than the bruise itself. It's when the swelling starts to go down that the new colors sprout up amid the black and blue. Purples, greens, yellows. Every time I catch my reflection, there's a whole different palette, palette in the piece of modern art on my face. I saw a little bit of orange yesterday. I'm the only one in my family who finds the changing colors around my eye socket so intriguing. In a weird way, it's easier on me. If I'm sick of looking at myself, all I have to do is stay away from mirrors. My parents don't have that option. When they see my black eye in any of its stages of evolution, they're stricken with guilt. Maybe it was the wrong decision to bring you home, my father reflects sadly. Of course it wasn't wrong, I try to assure them. I hated Melton. But aren't you afraid that my mother lets out a short, wheezing sob in C-sharp. It might start again. Afraid? Sure I am. When Chase, Aaron, and Bear were all over me last year, it was painful, humiliating, and downright scary. If you can't even ride your bike without a lacrosse stick sailing out of nowhere and sending you flying, life becomes impossible. You know, it's not your fault. You know those guys are idiots, and yet you can't help thinking that somehow you deserve it, that you might be just a teeny bit less worthy than everybody else. After all, how come no one is picking on any of them? But as worried as I am about all that, I think that what bothers me the most is how wrong I was about Chase. I honestly believed he'd changed. I was even starting to like the guy. It goes to show how mistaken a person can be. My parents' reaction is bad enough. My sister is off the chain. Every change in the bruised topography of my face launches her into a new revenge fantasy about what she would do to Chase if I were in charge of the world. Some of these are so brutal and in some cases so downright gross that I have to cut her off. Come on, Shosh, I exclaim as the two of us head for Brendan's house on Sunday morning. Listen to yourself like you'd ever put another human being through a wood chipper. I never said another human being, she replies evenly. I said alpha rat. And if you were paying attention, I said I'd fix him in feet first. That way, he gets to watch while his whole lower body... Enough, I interrupt. You wouldn't do that. Nobody would do that. The Spanish Inquisition didn't do that. Only because the wood chipper hasn't been invent hadn't been invented yet, she tells me sullenly. Anyway, I sigh, anxious to change the subject. I wonder what Brendan wants. What do you think? She snarls, still in a bad mood. He has another stupid idea for a YouTube video, and we're the cast and crew. The text said that it's not, I remind her. It better not be, otherwise Brendan's going in the wood chipper. <laughs> That's my sister. No problems ever so small that she can't overreact to it. We start up the Espinzola's front walk and come face to face with Kimberly. Oh, hi guys. She gives me a long, hard look. Your eye is better, she adds. I'm okay, I say quickly. I don't want Shosh to nominate any more candidates for the wood chipper. You also got the text, my sister asked Kimberly. She nods, and Chase is coming too. What, Chase? 
Shosh grabs my arm and starts dragging me back down the walk. Brendan explodes uh, out of the front door and runs up to us. Where are you going? Chase Ambrose isn't coming anywhere near me or my brother, Shosh sees. That's why I invited you. Chase is innocent. She keeps pulling me along. Well, not totally innocent, Brendan pleads, but he didn't hit Joel on purpose. He was just blindsided as we were. I've got proof. What proof, I ask. One man band, he explains. The video survived, and it provides, it proves that Chase was trying to stop Aaron and Bear. We're going home, Shosh insists. You go home, I tell her. I'm staying. Here, she demands. With that guy coming over? This time, I don't let her push me around. I want to know what happened. I have to see it for myself. And she stays too, probably because she thinks I need protection. A lot of guys would be embarrassed about that, but I'm at least a little bit grateful. At any minute, Chase is going to walk in Brendan's front door, and I can't predict how I'm going to feel about it. I've seen him around school here and there. Still, this will be the first time since the fire extinguisher incident that we will be in the same room together. We establish ourselves on the living room couch and Brendan sets up a computer on the coffee table. I transferred this from the flip cams, he explains. I brought it home to shoot something else and this is what was on it. He puts out some snacks and we settle in to wait for Chase. 20 minutes go by. Then we're up to half an hour. Kimberly is impatient, mostly because Chase is the only reason she's here. Where is he? Brendan texts again. No answer. Well, what did you expect? Shash scoffs. He said he was coming, Brendan insists. He cares a much, as much about you as he cares about everybody else except himself. Zero. Face it, he blew you off. My sister stands up. Let's go, Joel. We're, we've already wasted enough of our lives, courtesy of Chase Ambrose. I turn to Brendan. Play the video. Chase can see it some other time. We fast forward through most of it, watching musician Brendan popping up all around the risers, playing different instruments for his one-man band. He switches into regular playback once the tuba sequence comes up. I feel my stomach muscles tense. As much as I've been bullied, I've never had the opportunity to actually watch it happen before. The impatient expression on Shash's face is replaced by one of intense concentration. I don't get it, Kimberly puts in. All I see is Brendan. Where's everybody else? You and Joel are there, but you're both out of the frame, Brendan explains. Keep watching. We hear Aaron and Bear fling the doors open, even though they're off camera. The first thing we actually see are two jets of white foam that catch Brendan full in the face. He goes down, tuba and all. It would be funny if I didn't know what was coming next. When the streams of foam change direction to some target off screen to the right, I know I'm the one in the line of fire. There's a lot of yelling going on and I hear my own voice in there with Brendan, Kimberly, and the two attackers. After a few minutes, after a few... Sorry, that was my timer. After a few more blasts of foam, Aaron and Bear step into the frame, appearing on the left side of the screen. The next part I remember all too well. Aaron and Bear are tossing instruments all over the place and trashing the band room. I try to take on Aaron, but he shoves me down into the foam. It's hard to watch, but not as hard as I thought it would be. This is not who I am, I tell myself. It's just something that happened to me. Somehow, seeing it unfold in real time, in high definition video, 
I'm able to expand the phrases, expand the fracas in the band room to include every rotten bullying thing that was ever done to me. And here I am, alive, undamaged, well, except my eye. I've been victimized, but I don't have to let that define me, and I don't have to be defined as a victim. I'm back, back at home, back to myself. That's when Chase makes his appearance on the computer screen. He seems totally stunned by what he finds. Even when Bear thrusts the fire extinguisher in his arms, I sit forward eagerly because that's my fire extinguisher, the one that's about to bash, my, bash me in the eye. As I watch Chase and Bear struggling over the shiny metal cylinder, I tense, knowing it's coming any second. I'm following the combatants, checking for the high sign, the nod of acknowledgement that shows that the three are in cahoots, and it's time to clobber the kid who got them put on community service. It doesn't come. Chase wins the tug of war, and my face gets in the way. That's all that happens. Brendan pauses the video. An accident, he says triumphantly. I agree, I tell him. Wow, Chase must be really strong, is what Kimberly gets out of it. Josh's cheeks are bright red as she digests the truth. My sister judges everything and everybody so harshly that when her judgment falls on herself, it's like the end of the world. He still lied, she says, tight-lipped. He's not perfect, Brennan agrees. But think of the trouble he would have been facing if he'd gotten blamed for all that. If it was you and you saw an easy way out, wouldn't you take it? Shash is stubborn. I wouldn't be in a mess like that because I don't hang around with pond scum. I look at her. We have to be we have to at least talk to him. I'm expecting more of an argument, but she nods. And I can th and I can think of plenty of things to say. One of the things should be I'm sorry, Brendan puts in poignantly. She glares at him. We'll see. But if it is, it'll be the last item on my list. Where is Chase? Kimberly asks, annoying in annoyance. Brendan, you said he was going to be here. Brendan is already on his phone talking with Miss Ambrose, Mrs. Ambrose. He frowns, thanks her, and hangs up. According to his mom, he's on the way to Portland Street, and she said he was in a real hurry. Did he forget to come? I ask. Brendan shakes his head. He said he'd be here. He just texted a couple hours. He just texted a couple of hours ago. Shash stands up. Let's go over to Portland Street. Ooh, and that's the end of the chapter. Whew. What will happen next? We will find out when we read chapter 27. And just to give you a little idea, chapter 27, chapter 28, there's a chapter 29. Chapter 30. There's 30 chapters, and we're through chapter 26. So we're nearing the end of the story. So, all right, we'll pick back up later.